Welcome to Carito Connects. I'm your host, Jen, and I've been conversing with friends around the world about life challenges and impactful moments. Conversations on this platform look at answering the questions, how we overcome challenges and how our experiences shape who we are and the work we do today. I hope this work can inspire you on your own personal and individual journey. Let's dive right in. Hello, my guest today is Muriel Morwitzer, also known as Mumu, and I'll I'll have you uh, pronounce for us properly later. Um, she is a senior educator for Art of Motion Academy Australia, a renowned training organization for contemporary Pilates and slings myofascial training based in Switzerland and Australia, operating worldwide, which was founded by Karin Guntner. Uh, I should practice my German. <laughs> Hi, Mumu. So nice to have you. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm excited to have Mumu on Carito Connect today. Uh, we actually never met and have just been social media friends thanks to technology these days. Uh, I've been following her for a few years now, and I'm thrilled that she accepted my invitation to share her own challenge and impactful moments that shaped who she is today and the work she does. So Mumu is going to discuss with us what showing up on the mat and creating topic-specific slings myofascia trainings, depending on life circumstances, means and has taught her. Uh, that in life, one needs to be open-hearted, adaptable, hopeful, trusting, and feel at home with one, within oneself versus a physical place. I think during the pandemic, all of us can really relate to this. So Mumu, I'll stop here and let you start by introducing yourself to our listeners uh, and how you first was introduced to myofascia training um, and why life circumstances really affect or inspire the way you create topics for class and trainings. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Muriel Morvitzer, but like you said, for many, it's a tongue twist. So most people around the world call me Mumu unless um, German or Swiss German or Spanish is their natural um, you know, way of speaking and they can roll their tongue. So you asked how I got into this. I used to be into dancing. And in the dance school that I was in in London, we had to do Pilates. And I'm forever grateful to it because it made me have no injuries and become stronger from the inside out. However, as me, as a young person, I um, fell in love. I left to Australia and stopped dancing pretty much from one day to the other. And um, decided though a year later to take it up again. And um, yeah, not being so well conditioned anymore, um, I thought I'd be, you know, able to just bounce back and drop back in. I suffered a few injuries and um, had to stop dancing. So, long story short, then I had different people suggest certain things, um, cortisone injections, um, keep on dancing, maybe I'd lose sensation to my leg, um, but at least I could stand on stage. And so I made a decision that I definitely didn't want to lose sensation to any part of my body and rather be able to take a break and see if my body can heal itself. Um, I did definitely lose somatic trust. Not that I knew that I lost somatic trust, but I definitely lost somatic trust. So because I was still very able in coordinating movement and I could still ski and snowboard and kayak and often I had discomfort sometimes afterwards, but through Pilates I could keep it at bay. But it definitely created an interest for me to learn more about the body and how I can support my body as well as other people's body in finding their full potential. Now, it took a little while. Um, I was 22 when I stopped dancing and had that injury. So at 27 is when I really started to delve back into teaching Pilates on a regular basis to clients and to try and understand 
what I understood intuitively more anatomically. And I had the great pleasure to meet Karin Gurtner. And um, Karin did exactly that. What I could intuitively sense that I wanted to um, enhance in people or understand more about myself, she could explain to me anatomically as well as how the body is interconnected. Fast forward a few years and um, we got into fascia and I was also very lucky to be asked by Karin to train under her to become a lecturer for um, Art of Motion. So she developed Anatomy Trains in Motion, which is using Tom Meyer's um, body map where it guides you to feel where there might be less force transmission or glide within the body. So by learning through Karin of how the fascial properties that we innately have affect my movement, um, I it was a it was a milestone change in my career. That's not best English, but I think you get the gist. So by learning more about what fascial properties are that we are born with, but then how we can specifically train them through movement and for me specifically to enhance tensile strength. So I was by nature quite adaptable, but I didn't have enough resilience. So if you imagine something that's adaptable, it will change its shape, but if it's not resilient enough, it doesn't reform back to its original shape with as much ease. Now, after a lot of contemplation and, you know, reflecting and a good honest look at myself, I also realized I was too adaptable mentally to at my own cost. So I was a pleaser, um, perfectionist. Um, I often felt I wasn't good enough. Um, why am I bringing this up? Because by consciously training for a more resilient fascial architecture that is adaptable, but at the same time resilient, it had a profound effect on my character as well. I started to be more okay with um, situations where that were not so harmonious or where there was conflict. Um, I was able to stay in my body and sense the discomfort and to stay grounded and to know that I'm resilient enough to bounce back from adversity physically, emotionally and energetically. And part of it was training for more tensile strength, what I talked about before. So you hear the word tension and strength. So when we have adequate tensile strength, it means we have an easeful, upright posture that is supported without having to do. And even though I was a dancer, um, I was always doing against gravity. I didn't know, but it's all that I was used to and it was quite effortful. So learning those body maps as defined by Thomas Meyer and applying these 12 movement qualities, um, fascial movement qualities that Karin derived from research and through experience really was a game changer for myself and the way that I could help my clients. So I touched on before that through my injuries, I lost somatic trust, which means trust within my own physical ability or within my body. And from the outside, it looked that I'm very able. And, you know, I felt fairly able to a degree because I was given a list of I should never snowboard again. I should never whitewater kayak again. I shouldn't ski again. I shouldn't dance again because I had prolapsed discs. On top of that, these prolapsed discs, I had a pregnancy just to add a little bit more stress to the body. <laughs> now, That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> it is. And... You know, but looking back, it's actually the body is amazing and what it can deal with. But because I was given a very long list of things I shouldn't do, it sort of reinforced that I'm broken and I can't be fixed. Or, I mean, the, the, the one neurologist just went, oh, you know, just have cortisone injections, you'll be fine. I mean, you might not be able to feel your leg, but for me, that wasn't fine. That's 
thankfully not how I was brought up and that, you know, I was brought up with quite a holistic way. And looking back as well, shortly before the injury, I was really unhappy. The second dance school that I went to, I was not happy in, but I could not fess up that I'm unhappy because I was so identifying with being a dancer. That I like that you brought that up with the somatic trust because that also kind of correlates to um, like the mindset, right? Like the emotional, physical side of things blending in together. So not only was your somatic trust in movement of your body uh, was a struggle, but also your mental side, right? Like your confidence, your insecurity, all these anxiety that you were feeling at the same time. And it sounds like what you described earlier with um, this learning that you did with Kareen um, also helped you kind of break through, like have a breakthrough through your body, but also with your mind. Absolutely. And I think some people address it through the mental, you know, you resource the mental, you strengthen that to find that trust again and then go from the body. And I addressed it from the body side of things. And exactly like you say, having less confidence in my body had a massive effect on my mental well-being because I was always capable before that. And I still came across capable and I was a pusher, so I did, but I lived in chronic pain. Um, and, yeah, I think that's, you know, th this is you summarized beautifully. And my pathway was through the mat and through my body that it also had a very healing effect um, psychosomatically. And there's never a one-way street. You know, you address the mind and you work with mindfulness, it will have a profound positive effect on your physical well-being. And the beauty is with, with fascia, because it is so closely linked to the nervous system, if you foster your fascial architecture, you will affect tone regulation within the fascial system. If you have good tone regulation in your fascial system, it has a positive effect on your nervous system. So it's a win-win. And some address the nervous system and with it, you know, they get a, best, a better or more harmonized or balanced, I should say, not harmonized, fascial tone. So it's exactly what you said. It's like one informs the other and we can address it through different ways and the way I address it is um, through the mat. And can I ask really quickly, when you talk about fascia to just, you know, the general public who don't, you know, like when, you, if you were socializing in some party and people don't know who you are and you say, oh, you know, I'm a, a myofascia teacher, instructor, and they look at you like, what are you talking about? What's your usual, you know, elevator pitch when you explain to people what fascia is and the amazing benefits of understanding fascia work and how it works with our body and our mind, our nervous systems. Mm, I can't say I've, I've practiced the elevator <laughs> pitch. I have to practice that still as in making it really short. Um, but I would say, you know, it's, it's your connective tissue and it is the system that houses every other system. So it houses the nervous system, it um, houses the muscular system, the lymphatic system, the vascular system. So in that sense, you can imagine it like uh, this very um, adaptable internal jumpsuit that connects everything with anything. So um, and the more integrated it is, the more you will feel. And the thing is, when you feel more, you can be very discerning of, or you can make a very informed decision if what you're doing is actually good for you. And this might sound really simple, but let's be honest. Like, I'm sure we can all think about something that we do on a daily basis that we know cognitively isn't that good for us or is really not good for us. And do we still do it? Yes, because the pleasure we get from it or the, the sensation it gives us or the relaxation or whatever, we do it, right? However, when we start to feel fully embodied and sense all of ourselves again, or at least more, 
we can sometimes make a really informed decision as in like, I'm in a great yoga class, but right now I need to come out of this because if I stay in it, I will pay for it. Just the circumstance today or the way I know myself, I need to come out of this post or adjust a post rather, and that is self-determined, yeah? I'm able to listen to, in that sense, the interceptive sense informing me you should adjust something for the well-being, for your own well-being or for homeostasis, a balanced homeostasis. However, knowingly or not, we go through life quite often and are other determined. And don't get me wrong, as a teacher, we hold the responsibility to guide our students in the best possible way. Yet, I, at one point in my career, made people dependent on me. I, I didn't want that, and I was unaware of it, but I wanted to prevent that anyone ever in their entire life would have to go through the chronic pain I went through. But I was overprotective, and I made them other determined, as in without, you know, without me, they're not safe, unless they already felt extremely able anyway. And yes, people had success, but they were extremely dependent on me. Even though my greatest gift that I wanted to give is give people these tools that they can feel self-determined. And I do feel to this day extremely grateful that a psychologist friend of mine pulled me up and said, what is your intention? I went to empower people, for them to realize they can heal themselves. And it was early in my career and I hadn't had all the insights I've had yet. Um, <laughs> and... I didn't know really a lot about fascia then, and I've totally gotten off the elevator pitch, sorry. Um, but then it really clicked, and I had to have a really hard look at myself and go, I am making people dependent on me. But if I can, if I can teach them that they feel themselves and that they organize their pelvis over their feet with, if needed, sometimes my guiding touch, but using my touch less correct as a correction all the time, or the language that I used of be careful or watch out, because with that, I didn't use resource-oriented language in the sense of mm -hmm. Let's tap into your full potential and resourcing where they were already able. And from there, they could address imbalances or weaknesses with a lot more somatic trust, that bodily trust in their ability. And I'm forever grateful that that happened within like the first two years of me being back in that job. And even though I still had a limited understanding, it was really a wake-up call of going, what is my intention? And to empower others to have me as the coach on the sideline of assisting them to rewrite their body story if they want to or their movement story. But I can never write your movement story or your body story. I can be your editor and assist you in what I think would be helpful to edit. But it is your curiosity and your choice if you feel that it is no longer useful, therefore you want to edit your movement story. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to what I said before, you know, sometimes then we have to go, oh yeah, I can cognitively see that what Mumu suggests is really not serving me anymore it's really to the detriment of my health but the value that you might hold and is attached to this constant movement pattern or exercise that you're doing is greater than wanting to feel more balanced right right I want to just circle back really quickly to, you know, very early on when you started um, sharing with us, when you said between your injury at two and to going back into rediscovering movement and finding somatic trust at 27, your own exploratory period, I guess we can call it in a way explore, exploration and healing at the same time. Um, were you also trying other modalities at, you know, during that time? So for instance, it could have been, you know, I think 
when we talk about these kind of topics these days, a lot of times people say, oh, yeah, you know, I went into a yoga class. Yoga is always very like a very common denominator for everyone, right? Trying yoga as movement, as stretching, as healing with breath work. Um, so I'm just a little bit curious for your own processing. Obviously, Corinne was a key individual to really help you with that, you know, delivery of discovering um, anatomy works and myofascia, but also kind of, you know, were, were you kind of trying out different things before you discovered Corinne? Um, and, and then obviously you found it and you're like, okay, this is, this really speaks to me and it really was working for me. Um, so I just thought if you could share with us a little bit about that little period of time for you. Yeah. So, um, I think at the very beginning, I mentioned that in the one bound school that I was in at the La Bound Center in London, we had to do Pilates. So when um, I was um, diagnosed with the slip discs, um, my godfather luckily is a, um, is a doctor and he said, well, do you want to go under the knife? And I went, no, I'm going to do everything possible to rehabilitate myself. And then he said, well, then don't do an MRI because that's trauma to the body. And if you're really curious at any point, we can do an MRI, but I would suggest then go and try and rehabilitate yourself. So um, that's what I did. I had um, a physio who worked on me and it was great, but it was really local. And again, it was just in the time being what we knew. You know, if anyone would have known a little bit, looked a little bit further up and down the lines, um, <laughs> instead of just focusing where I had the most pain, things would have potentially shifted faster. But they didn't. And it's, she, you know, she did great work. Um, and I, did whatever I could remember from being in that dance school. So I just um, freestyled my own rehabilitation um, with a pregnancy on top. And um, after my first born was six months, I started to be a dance teacher again. Um, and I only taught three classes a week. But um, in a way, by not letting the diagnosis be my only label of who I am, I progress. And I'm extremely grateful to this physio and um, an osteopath and my godfather who they sort of put some trust back into me in comparison to all the others who gave me the list of what I should never do. So they kept just feeding a little bit this am amber, if we talk about a fire, this ember, sorry, of, you know, to keep the fire of believing in my healing capacity. And so two years later, I had another, I had another pregnancy um, and, you know, by then I was in less discomfort, but I lived in discomfort. It was just not quite as acute. So through Pilates, I could keep things at bay. Um, but also at the time, um, and I, I think classical Pilates is great, but it's limited to a degree in my eyes. Um, so... Through my dance, I always brought in different things. Like I always also listened to my body in the sense of like, oh, what about this? But one thing that I, that I do, did is like, you know, I was like, oh, I think I'm fine. So I would just push to what I was used to, I could, and I would go back. So it was a lot of up and down roller coastering of um, instead of staying a little bit, you know, staying a little bit with less load, um, for a longer period but I was you know um it's all what I what I knew and then I got back into teaching and I taught quite a bit for having two little kids my own studio and you know teaching up to 24 classes a week was a lot for me um but it's also what I loved but with it I started training a little bit less did that work in my favor? No, it didn't work in my favor. Because in my head, I had this idea that I had to get on the mat one hour a day. Now, anyone who has kids, even if they're older than what mine were um, at the time of four and six, it's an hour a day on the mat, even people who don't have kids. That's, you know, that's amazing. But I think it's a lot more realistic to show up at the beginning, show up five minutes a day. I just wasn't there. I just had this concept and I was, you know, like, this is the time frame and it had to happen at this time in the day. And if it didn't, then, you know. Um, that's your, your perfectionist personality coming in again and kicking, <laughs> kicking in. <laughs> Absolutely. And also a bit, 
you know, a little bit rigid. So that's too adaptable that I talked about, but not resilient enough. I think sometimes we're adaptable, then it's like, but what do you mean? It's it's not happening in the time frame I want. It's you're also not, you know, it's a it's a you're also in a way not adaptable enough because you don't have that resilience. Meaning if something doesn't go exactly how you planned it, you'll just squeeze it in, not to hopefully squeeze it in, but find another <laughs> place for it. So more like what you said, like, you know, so I, I always worked with the body. I was always interested. And if I didn't move, my husband noticed really fast, it has an immense effect on my mental health. So, you know, he'd just be like, you know, go for a run or like just go for that 45 minute walk and then come back. Or, you know, he's like, just, just go and clear your head. Um, and so he realized really fast that movement for me, if that was a, you know, a run, if it was a walk, if it was that, that, that really had a big, um, mental effect. And another he's very, person, he's very intuitive, he's very intuitive to notice that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, he also always noticed that I would come back and like anything that I was annoyed at before or, you know, it had disappeared. I realized like, oh, my God, there's no use of holding on. So it worked in the benefit from here for him as well. <laughs> um, so in that time where I started teaching a lot again and another osteopath who I met in where I live now, he at one point said, I won't treat you anymore unless you put more time into yourself. And I was like, what? Because I used to go to him and he was just like, it was like, oh, my God, okay, someone's going to look after me, you know, like, um, you know, just fix me. And he was like, you teach people that you can't fix them, that you can assist them. And you're, you know, I, I didn't say it in that way, fix me, but he was very intuitive and could sense my energy, my intention is like, yeah. oh, my God, you know, like literally deep down I'm a victim. Um, save me. And uh, okay. that, that insight so clearly then, but that was the path of being it. That's really powerful because I think a lot of us probably have that habit too, right? And I think the fact that this osteo was so upfront and honest, that's very beautiful. I think not many practitioners or teachers, like you said earlier, recognize that um, because there's so much truth in that, right? Like all of us would be like, I need to go for my weekly massage because... If, you know, because I'm just so tired that if I just go, that my therapist will fix me up, give me a quick fix, and then I'm ready to go. And you just keep repeating that cycle where actually you need to do the work and you can fix it so that you don't have to go every week. So I think that's a really good example you brought up right there. Mm. And not, you know, and sometimes it's it's great what you said, like, I think that sometimes it's these days, it's like, what is my intention behind it? And you go, I want to be nourished. You know, I know this person can hold space for me and I just want to be nourished. Go for it. But for me, you know, and then when he went, when he said, I'm not going to treat you anymore unless you start investing more time, you have all the tools and you're not using them for yourself. And it was like a slap in the face with the <laughs> kindest, most genuine care for me. Yeah. And yeah. I'm so grateful. And it was a similar time of when that that um, psychologist said the same thing to me. And I was like, oh, my God. Um, and to then realize, okay, it's rather invest 15 minutes. Or for many people, it's maybe five minutes at the beginning. Start with five minutes a day to change a habit and to create a healthy movement habit. Because if it goes on to the, the to-do list, then you most likely just go onto autopilot and you will not benefit the way that I benefited. And I don't judge anyone. I've done classes on autopilot because it's like, I need to be fit. I'm the ex dancer and I'm the Pilates teacher and I'm an educator. And my intention for getting on the mat was something completely different. You know, it was at the time there were valuable reasons for me. These days, the reasons why I get on the mat are really really different or for different reasons yeah but that's part of the evolution right like we all go through these different phases so whatever phase you're in acknowledge it and embrace it and know that you know everything is temporary not permanent and it shifts 
Yeah. Um, so let, I, let's uh, go, go into the conversation of how you curate your teachings, right? And, and again, when we did the introduction earlier, um, we had mentioned some of the different experiences you've had in the last few years um, and how that really shapes uh, your expansive tool and knowledge box and how you share that with your clients, uh, both offline and online now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've used, in the last few years, I've used my personal training that I put together um, with, you know, looking at what do I physically need because maybe I still want to unravel an, a pattern. What do I emotionally need and what do I energetically or spiritually need? So depending on the person, you know, um, for me personally, it's also what do I feel like I spiritually need or what does my soul need? And um, so with these three, then I design a small class for myself. And I do it for sometimes two months and sometimes I do it for three months. So an example is in um, early 2020, just before um, COVID, um, I had a long conversation with my dad who was really unwell. And I knew he is dying. And so I was still lecturing and I flew to the countries that I was lecturing in and Shortly before I flew out um, to go and lecture, I designed a program with a lot of, um, it had a lot of dynamic stability. It had adaptability in it, really focusing on resilience as well, always coupled with grounding and stabilizing exercises with um, focusing on enhancing kinesthesia, which means really um, fine tuning the proprioception and um, having very clear interceptive um, feedback so that I could listen to my internal, what I call barometer or my intuition or my gut brain of what I actually need and not override it with my head brain. Um, so I put that in and, um, and glide and tissue hydration just because I knew it's a stressful situation to just really keep my, um, my fascia hydrated, therefore my cells and my immune system in a better um, state and through glide you enhance um, also, for instance, kinesthesia. Um, so like I said before, and with it always having a lot of dynamic stability, and I did this the entire um so from january he passed in august in he passed in april um until about end of end of may so for a long time i tweaked a few things sometimes but the main structure of the class was the same because it was the only thing in my life that was not changing and you know you said it i think earlier nothing is permanent you know not even my my own class is permanent, but it was like with all these changes, and at the time we didn't know COVID is happening. I mean, yes, there was these whispers as I flew out of Australia to um, to Russia and to Norway and stuff. It was always like, maybe you shouldn't get on the next plane. Maybe you shouldn't get on the next plane. Um, so there was a bit of uncertainty. So I purposely created that class. I also knew that for when I stopped lecturing that for an entire month I would help one of my brothers who was caring for our dad physically to get him in and out of bed and he was cognitively still very very there um, and it was my little respite my little place of it that was impermanently permanent or you know it just was like a sense of okay and it grounded me and things that I put in was really to be at home within myself and I am so so grateful that by then that that only happened two years ago because at that time I had experienced that I am enough that the only place I can truly be at home in is within myself and or at least if I feel truly at home within myself I can be anywhere in the world and still have a sense of belonging and calm. 
so to your question that's so I purposely designed that class to have physical resilience because I had to you know he is, was a tall man and to help him physically and also to have that mental and emotional resilience to to say goodbye to someone who I dearly love mm. I liked how you thread it all back together because it goes back to uh, we're going to talk. I'm going to bring up your osteo again, where he said, you know, you need to take care of yourself first. You have all these tools. And that's exactly what you did here by knowing that you were going to go on this very long trip, right? Doing your workshops and your teaching, but also care for your father and kind of going, okay, what keeps me grounded? Right. What's going to keep, what's going to be this thing that's going to keep me grounded while I navigate all this chaos. And, you know, slowly, like you said, the world is unfolding with COVID and all these uncertainties. And that was, that was for you, what was very grounding and kept you going. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was that constant little Island of just tuning in every day. Where am I at? And so of course that, that changed of how I felt on the day, but you know, having that, that class to go to and doing it really mindfully. That's, that's the, you know, it wasn't on the to-do list to really use it as an active meditation as a, you know, like, and on the mat, I have so many insights and, you know, I have days where the insights are minute and sometimes they're massive and whatever, when I start to recognize like, ah, here's this habitual movement pattern that sneaks in. At one point, I can always link it to an habitual behavior or thought pattern and go like, oh, wow, I, was, I really thought that I changed that belief. And so <laughs> when I fully unravel it, then I have to, for me personally, if I only address it cognitively, somewhere in my, in my body, it still reacts. And like, you know, some talk about the body keeps the score and I definitely have seen that a lot in myself and in clients. So it's a great pathway to address it cognitively. However, your fascia is the first thing that reacts. It reacts even before your nervous system. We just can't comprehend it. We can't even comprehend our nervous system reacting, right? Mm. So, you know, to work with all these different systems together and my dad gifted me so many things because he had – He was so cognitively alert that he had atypical Parkinson and atypical polyneuropathy that I was able to still work with him or to go, you know, I know you're in pain, but, you know, how could he still appreciate his body in these little things through sensation, through sound, through sight, through being able to play music anymore, uh, to play music while he couldn't ski anymore or do these other things that he loved he was a very physical um person and also a very musical person but to yeah to even even there to still if we can help someone to feel and appreciate their body as much as possible is still a different experience than just going like i can't get wait to get rid of that and i'm not saying it wasn't a relief to get rid of his physical um, body, um, I'm sure it was. And, um, but it, it still changed the experience. And because he was so cognitively alert, we could have so many conversations. It gifted me so many things of how I can work with people with physical trauma or autoimmune diseases or PTSD and all of these other things. So, um, and my own experience of how me showing up on the mat, like what you said before, can could really make a difference of how I physically and emotionally felt. Wow, that's so powerful. I felt I feel like two years ago, what you experienced there is going to unravel going forward for you in terms of your offerings and, and what we're going to see going forward. So that's very, very exciting. Um, I do recall that you had one more example. Uh, obviously, we're going to go into talking about the pandemic and so many of us um, around the world who had to be in lockdown and experience, you know, being at home. And um, I think people were, you know, signing up for online classes. And that was a whole booming industry during during the pandemic. Uh, how was it for you in terms of not being able to conduct workshops in person and having a shift? I think a lot of instructors during that time had to 
really figure out, well, how do I do Zoom classes and like, how do I do payments, you know? Um, so what was it like for, for you? And again, um, how did you, I guess, shape your offerings? Because uh, having had taken one class already with you online, I do feel like it's probably very different if I did it in person with you. And also it's a very different way of learning from either a Pilates class or a yoga class, because it's very, very technical too. But also, like you said, you need to be very in tune with your body because even the cues, if you're not, you can't really understand what you're you know, like what you're trying to do or how you're trying to do extension or when you talk about like, you know, making your tissues more fluid, right? And if you don't really understand that, you're like, what do you mean make my tissues more fluid? <laughs> so I'm I'm just throwing it out there for you to share with us a little bit about, yeah, during that pandemic period, the last uh, year and a half, two years. Well, teaching wise, it, um, you know, it, it changed a lot. It really made me look at um, the identity that I was strongly attached to, even though I didn't know it, um, to be a worldwide lecturer. And I traveled extensively and have seen many, many places, often just for three days um, but um, or four days. But yeah, you know, to go, okay, I clearly identify a lot with that. Who who else am I or what else can I bring? And at the same time, it gifted me one of the most amazing things because whenever I was in those countries, people would want to work with me. And it was like, I'm getting on a plane again tomorrow. You know, I would love to work with you, but here I am jet setting to the next place um, to teach and inspire people um, to that's when I'm teaching teachers to inspire them, you know, to find their full potential and learn a lot about themselves, but also how they can enhance their clients' um, abilities. So what it did is it opened an entire world for me to work with people worldwide and they don't have to buy an air ticket <laughs> or to be with me. Um, and the setting that you did is, of course, very different because it was a master class. So in that sense, I didn't have the camera on where I see you where if you would do a coaching with me, it's all about you. As in where I watch you and I talk you through it and I look at what your, where your habitual postural patterns, um, movement patterns sneak in that don't serve you. And then, of course, always in consideration with your intention, why you want to work with me and your short and long-term goals together with what I think posturally or physically, energetically, and emotionally, we can resource in you to then address some imbalances. And my short and long-term goals, I create a home program for you in the scope that is realistic for you. And so for you, it might be 10 minutes a day. Then it's like, okay, should we design three small home programs so you can alternate them? Um, and then, you know, we of course, teach, we of course look at um, relook at them over a few weeks. So then there is a very different setting. And then I teach for um, art motion as a lecturer and anatomy trains. Um, and there again, you know, like I, I do think now there's maybe, you know, some are really happy to be face to face again. And it's so wonderful to work um, face to face with people. I, I love it. I adore it. And I do, you know, um, I'm quite a tactile person. So not being able to give people a hug after we've done like a four day course and you feel you know each other. Um, I miss that. But it's also allowed some people who don't have the money, you know, for accommodation and potentially flying to another country has really allowed them to be able to do um, our education. And yeah, so I, actually it's, it's gifted me a lot. And one other thing, not that you specifically asked that, but um, I read that or I heard that out through in between the lines. As a teacher, you, I had to become really aware of my language because when I'm in a room with someone, my body language, the way that I can guide movement, all of that makes the package of what I'm giving them. Whereas in when it's just verbally and, you know, to become really aware of the resource oriented language um, that I'm using. 
and um, sometimes going, okay, this this cue doesn't work. So looking at habitual cues that I just use, you know, I'm, I've been teaching for years. So do you yeah. really go like, oh, how am I going to explain that? And it is fortunate that English isn't my mother tongue. However, I speak it way better almost than Swiss German these days. And I pretty much only teach in English. I can teach in German, but it's not as fluent. But still there to my, ad, my advantage is that English is my mother tongue. So I teach a lot of people who aren't English speaking and then mm -hmm. to describe or use other words, but also becoming aware that I am very habitual in English and I use, I can use slang or I use very Australian terms. So there to really refine my language and refine the language that it's as technical as it needs to be, but to give a sensory experience that they embody and not just cognitively, you know, embrain it. So it's like, yes, embrain it so you're safe and you understand some of your habitual patterns, but then how can I linguistically make them feel more glide or maybe you know the fluidity that can move through their tissue and so forth so yeah um you know it was hard and definitely at times because I'm an international family and my kids went to school in Switzerland and we were in Australia and often we were apart and Australia wasn't that open so it was challenging times but it also the paradox is it has gifted me so many things or it has made me refine so many things and made me be able to be connected like with people like you you know mm, yeah I uh yeah so speaking of kids uh I wanted to ask and and this will be my last uh question before we sort of wrap up our conversation but in terms because you had mentioned working with your dad right so that's a, a demographic like the elderly community um and, and, and so forth. But in terms of kids and work and allowing them to be more intuitive at a, at a young age, uh, I don't know if you teach kids at the moment or if you, you know, interact with uh, kids to teenagers and as they shift through their bodies. And these days, as we all know, everyone is so tech savvy. Um, you were on our screens a lot and there's not as much movement for kids as, um, you know, back in the day when maybe you and I were growing up. And so I'm just curious in terms of some of the observations you've made or what kind of encouragement you would say to parents maybe who are listening to our current episode of how to encourage kids to find that somatic trust, right, uh, in terms of their own body movement, but also just um, intuitively as well, because they're so linked together. Mm -mm. It's a whole topic. It would be an entire topic to really delve into, to have a whole conversation. And this conversation is extremely close to my heart. Um, before I decided to become a dancer, I actually was very much contemplating to become a midwife. So um, babies, kids, um, kids' development um, is really close to my heart. And when I was a dance teacher, again, I mostly worked with teenagers, to create dance projects where they could – express what is sometimes so hard to express as a teenager verbally to find confidence within their body and to just express um and i do think it helped them and everyone you know some of them who were the shyest most introverted kids and yet they chose no one had to come to my dance class they chose it and to just see their transformation so uh Unfortunately, our school systems, and I'm making a vast generalization here, but it's cutting out movement more and more and more. And I grew up in a very different school and movement was a big part. And, you know, once a week we all went skiing. We had to go hiking for six and four days in autumn and in summer. And like I said, I did whitewater kayaking. You can do climbing. You can do um ultimate frisbee and so forth so there is a lot of movement involved even if it is pottery even if it's so in the school that i grew up in besides the academics the what we did with our hands and what we did with our body and what we did playing instruments was equally important so it was again that trinity not just the cognitive has to be developed not just the iq but the the whole package so to speak um, together with emotional and kinesthetic intelligence 
and lucky, you know, some great people are starting to steer that emotional intelligence is really important. However, if you don't have kinesthetic intelligence, you don't have more empathetic people. So as in, of course, emotional intelligence plays a big part, but it's again a trinity, like all these three have to come together for someone to be whole. Now, just two small inputs. Parents who have babies start to pay attention. We mostly, with with great, um, you know, um, it's no one's, it's what we are taught. We do to our babies. However, if you put a little jumper on the, just at the top of the baby's head, they're going to push. Let them push. Put the little sleeve on their hand and let them be a part. Don't just do to your baby. If your two-year-old wants to have a hammer and have a go, don't have a verbal avalanche at them of, be careful of that. Take their hand, wrap it around that little hammer, wrap your hand around it. The fastest learning pathway is through kinesthesia. Do it with them. So I think we live in a, we live in the most safest time ever, even though we don't believe it. You know, we are in the most safest time ever. But we become extremely super cautious. I was lucky. I mean, I want, I'm one out of five kids. Maybe that's the reason. Like, I disappeared into the woods four hours on end. Lucky nothing ever happened. I was always with a friend. My parents knew I was in the forest, but that forest is huge. And I always had to be with a friend. But we did whatever in that forest from seven years old, climbing trees, swinging from tree to tree, falling down. Like, we were just given that freedom and I grew up in the Swiss Alps and yes, there is nothing dangerous and there is no, you know, but the same, my kids grew up in Australia most of the time. And when we lived on acreage, we just let our son roam with his friend. You know, yes, there's dangerous animals in Australia, but they were savvy. Like they knew about it and it, it's so important that we give our kids the opportunity to explore. Very often we too fast come in with good advice. And, and I'm, I'm totally, you know, I'm uh, guilty of it. You know, I'm like such an advice giver and to just go, they need to experience, let them experience. And going back to, or not going back, but it's a really simple example of we tell every kid, don't touch the hot plate, it's hot. Every kid will touch the hot plate or the fire or whatever. You have to make an experience. You can cognitively understand something, but until you've experienced it, it's not embodied. So more as in what your question is like, try and get your kids to move because school doesn't do it anymore. Or if you're not good at sport, you just don't get fostered. Like you, it doesn't get fostered. You know, if you're good, then here you go. You know, you're in that team and you're doing this and that. But the importance is that we give everyone a chance to experience. Everyone can move. But very often we don't see their ability or we don't take the time to see what is their ability. And with it, they feel insecure and they go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do sport. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for putting that out there. Uh, you totally nailed it. And I think that's very, very important messaging. Um, so, okay, we're running short on time. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing uh, your story and your journey and, you know, uh, what fascia is and, and, and what anatomy trains is. And before we leave, uh, I usually ask my guests this question. So you can answer however you want. Um, I usually ask, you know, what are some two cents or, you know, words of wisdom, or sometimes I say, what would you tell your younger self what you know now? Uh, you know, or basically to the audience who are listening and tuning into this episode and really relating to your storyline, um, you know, what kind of advice would you give? And then lastly, I usually ask um, what kind of books or podcasts or whatever it is that keeps you grounded. But I think we all know the answer because you had repeatedly expressed what keeps you grounded <laughs> in our conversation. But I just thought I'd, you know, put it out there. So these are my two last questions for you. Um, to my younger self, um, listen to the self-talk. So again, resource language. We might be, you know, talk to yourself how you would talk to your dearest friend, how you would talk to your child. 
um, yeah, really be aware of how you talk to yourself. It has a massive impact on how you feel in your body, physically, mentally, and emotionally. That would be the thing. And um, daring to love myself with all the imperfections. Um, and it's just, it was a hard journey and the most rewarding journey ever. And podcasts, there is a lot. There is like um, Brene Brown is a massive inspirer. I draw so much meaning from her and translate that onto the mat and into clients. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert, Karin Gortner, um, Gil Headley. Um, I also, at 17, I went to Nepal. So I do have um, a love for some... Buddhistic inputs like um, Jack Hornfield, Tara Brach. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different. Um, I love neuroscience. I don't, I can't say I'm an expert in it, but I love that kind as well. So the the book, The Body Keeps the Score, and um, the Brain That Changes Itself. I think there's a vast array of interests yeah. that I have, um, but from all of it, I draw meaning. And it informs of how I teach for myself and how I teach my clients. Okay, awesome. I am going to put all of those resources in the episode resource guide so people can follow you and find uh, your classes and your offerings and also check in on the podcast and the books you had recommended. Um, and yes, I hope to see you in Taipei soon. <laughs> Or somewhere in the world, somewhere in the world. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to Curito Connects. For more Connects content, collaborations, and discoveries set to inspire you on your own individual journey, please head to our website at www.curito.co. Until next time, stay inspired and thank you for joining us at Curito Connects.